Welcome to another Dragonlance Saga review episode. It is Kirnor Frost Cult, the 27th, I believe. My name is Adam, and today I'm going to give you my spoiler review of the short story and contents of uh, the Journal of Kaz the Minotaur. Now, this is uh, The Lost Colony by Richard Knack, and Dragonlance Nexus as a whole all got together and put this together between the two parties. I would like to take a moment and thank the members of this YouTube channel and invite you to consider becoming a member by visiting the link in the description below. And you can even pick up Dragonlance materials like this one using my affiliate links, and those are also in the description below. All right, so uh, this is my perspective only. So if yours differs, that's okay, that's life. Let me know in the comments. If you're joining live, put them in chat. If you're watching this after the fact, that's all right. Thanks for tuning in. Put them in the comments. Let me know. Ultimately, when we share ideas, we come out with something called perspective. <laughs> and that is a net positive, no matter what. All right, so that being said, the way that traditional novel reviews go is I just give you a rough summary and my thoughts on the story of the novel. In this particular case, it's one short story, and it was too short, in my opinion. <laughs> I wanted more. What are you going to do? When you have a good story, that's, that's all you can do, right? But this is also a game supplement material. And so, like, the images that I'm showing here are images that are on DM's Guild. I'm not actually showing the, you know, individual PDF pages in the book. This is all the promotional material from DM's Guild. Just making sure everyone knows so <laughs> they know I'm not messing with them or stealing their stuff or anything. Um, that being said, I'm not a big 5th edition fan. I play it. I'm running a 5th edition game for like a year. <laughs> the Shadow of the Dragon Queen. And I'm actually having a great time with the players. The story's pretty good. I mean, I, I don't mind the story at all. But 5th edition and Dragonlance, for me personally, don't really mesh well together. Uh, and so I have actually rejected reviewing other 5th edition material since I did a couple uh, earlier this year, or maybe it was late last year or something like that. In this particular case, anytime Dragonlance Nexus puts something out, you know it's going to be good. But I didn't want to give them an unfair advantage simply because I know most of them and I like most of them. I think, you know, to be fair, the reason why I'm reviewing this versus anyone else's 5th edition materials that they've submitted to me was because of the short story by Richard Knack. That is why I'm reviewing this primarily. And the sort of, you know, bonus is that you get a solid group of talented individuals making it. So I'm going to get into all of that too, but I just want to give a little justification because, you know, the people who have asked me to review their stuff that I've rejected in the past or turned down is a better word or phrase. <clears throat> I don't want you to feel bad. And it's not you. It's me. <laughs> so let's just leave it at that. All right. So let me dive in. Hey, Chris, how you doing? Thanks for tuning in live. Uh, 12E nerd from the future. D&D 12E. Hey, Edward, how you doing, man? Good to see you. Um, yeah, I'm just going to give you my, uh, my pre-written review, and then let's just sort of chat about this. Again, this is a spoiler, so if you haven't picked this up yet, click the link in the description, buy it, read it, then come back and watch it, because where there's not like a whole lot to spoil in this short story... It does set up some basic premises for what you're going to find in the actual supplement and adventure. Basic. Um, and so if you want to go in something completely blank, turn this off and go do your thing. <laughs> Have some fun. I don't know. Coffee talk or something, right? All right, here we go. So the short story, The Colony, by Richard Knack, focuses around Kaz and his followers leaving Nethosac to find a new homeland. Obviously, this is set back when Kaz was alive, after Kaz the Minotaur. There has been like a trilogy of books and a series of short stories that I have not read. So I don't know where this fits in with all of that. Just basing this off of this alone. Now, they don't want to remain so close to the Blood Sea Minotaur Kingdom as a future emperor might try to reincorporate them into the Empire if they did. So they set sail for the unknown eastern Korean Ocean. The trouble with the short story is that it's short. 
Much of it is taken up by reintroducing characters for the sake of those readers who haven't read every short story or novel featuring Kaz, and while I did appreciate that, I felt like it was largely wasted, as much of the information dump had little or no bearing to the actual content of the short story. You could have really just slipped in some key names slash relationships and just moved forward with the uh, short story, or expanded the short story a little bit more as well. So they come across an unknown island that has an abandoned colony. The architecture resembles the Minotaur race, so they go in and take a small party ashore to investigate. It looks like there was once a thriving community here, but they soon learn what happened to them. Massive, this is so dope, actually. Massive lobster-like creatures attack them, and while they narrowly drive them off, they are a genuine threat. As Kaz orders the Minotaurs back to the ship, he looks for Delvin, his kender friend. Apparently everyone needs a kender friend. Or maybe they don't need him. They just have one, whether they like them or not. <laughs> whether they want to have them or not. Um, Delvin seems to have found the captain of the colony and his maps, as Kaz realizes the colony was built on an even more ancient one. The lobster creatures are operating a gateway to another world, seemingly trying to bring more of their kind in. Kaz does his best to destroy the portal, and more of the monsters come, and so do minotaurs from his ship. They fight the lobster monsters off and abandon the island using the maps Delbin found to sail to the islands of the southeast. And to be fair, I'm not sure how far southeast they can sail before actually hitting the polar ice cap, but it's just... Pre Presented as like a sort of a non-canon story by the author anyway, so I'm not sure it really matters, just giving abstract directions and stuff. It doesn't have to be literal. So this story is great. It is, um, it, it sort of felt to me like a tale from the Iliad or the Odyssey, which is a good thing. Mixed with like a touch of Cthulhu vibe due to the portal and like the, you know, monstrous creatures that came through it. I would like to know more about the creatures and their mission, and I want to know what happened to Kaz and his people in the story, but I suppose we're just going to have to wait for that for a future story. Again, it is short. It's actually a number of pages in the, in the supplement, but as far as a story goes, it's a setup. It's not a payoff. And that, as someone who likes to read, is a bit frustrating. Now, I understand that it is a sort of teaser setup to the adventure, which goes in, in my imagination when I was reading The Colony, dramatically different directions than what the adventure takes it into. I'm not going to spoil that part of it. Um, and there's some interesting setups and stuff, but I'll go into my review of the uh, adventure here in just a minute here. So this that was the entirety of the story. Great setup, great situations, really engaging thoughts and ideas. It reminded me like Clash of the Titans too. It was really, really cool. And one of the great things about Richard Knack's Minotaurs, and I should just say Dragonlance Minotaurs because he's pretty much defined all of Minotaurs for all of Dragonlance, is that they're very sort of Greek-slash-Roman-inspired, not just in the way they interact with the world or see themselves as a society and stuff, um, but that's how I imagine their architecture, their ships, and just everything, right? And so when I'm like reading this, and anytime you get boats in a scene, I'm thinking Clash of the Titans. There's going to be some cool monsters. There's going to be claymation skeletons, and in this case, claymation uh, lobster men, which was awesome in my head. Just really cool stuff, right? Nothing to, like, shoot down other than it was too short. And that is high remarks, because I usually have a lot of stuff to pick apart when it comes to Dragonlance stories. Okay, so let's talk about what else is in this collection here, because this is not just... A short story. And I know some people who may, you know, they may not give the benefit of the doubt to those that they're not aware of. This could easily be seen from the outside as a vehicle for someone to just capitalize on the name of Richard Knack, right? They're like, oh no, we're going to put out a product on the back of like a really great story, but the product's not really going to have any substance and the adventure is just going to be a throwaway thing because really we're just riding the coattails of, of a very famous author in the Dragonlance world, right? That is not the case with this. They do something in this book that I never expected, I never even thought about before, and very similar to what they did in their uh, Tasseloff's Pouches of Everything. Um, they exploit some mechanic ideas and grow them 
into a very interesting, uh, very setting specific way. Now, I'm not just trying to, you know, hype these, um, the team up because whatever, but like they put out straight up ship statistics and ship fighting rules in this, like sailing and ship battles. And like, I, I grew up watching like Sinbad, the seven voyages of Sinbad, you know, really great claymation and just adventurous stuff. And, you know, you think of like pirates, I, you watched a ton of black and white pirate movies as a kid, that stuff on the high seas of adventure. It's crazy exciting. One of the best parts of uh, Dragonlance, um, other lands supplements was its cover. It had this massive galleon being attacked by this massive uh, sea dragon, which is dope as hell. Now you can actually do that in 5th edition. I don't remember any other edition except for maybe first really detailing this stuff out this specifically. I never tried seafaring battles in 3rd edition, so I'm not sure if they did or not. But to my knowledge, they didn't. Um, so this is a whole new way of exploring, adventuring overland, overseas. You can, you can make up whatever you want, but it's nice having all of the mechanics put out there for you. They have specific roles for members of the crew, which is great. So if you're in a situation where there's like a ship on the horizon and you can tell, you know, through your gnomish spyglass what the flag is and you want to raid them or you're afraid of them coming to raid you... There are mechanics here for everyone on board having some sort of role in that encounter, from spotting it to getting up to it or evading it to attacking it and boarding it. I mean, there's tons of stuff, and it's not overwhelming. I mean, it's it's pretty stripped down, and it's meant to be simple, like 5th edition is meant to be. And so it's not something you'd get overwhelmed by, but it's an added depth that 5th edition is sorely lacking in. And I know Spelljammer people are going to be pissed because <laughs> this is like the first ship-to-ship -ship battle ever presented. And it's like a year and a half, two years after Spelljammer came out, which should have been the place where you showcase ship battles, right? I didn't buy the supplement, so if it's there, my bad. But I heard that it didn't have it, which is why I bring it up. So it's very cool that they created that specifically. But again, this is a Minotaur-based supplement, so you kind of have to have that aspect of it. But what they did in here is they went through all of the different sources of Minotaur. It's basically like if you're going to be writing a wiki, like I know they did, or if you're going to be writing an episode like I have done, you read all of the different editions, versions of the history of Minotaurs, because not only do they sort of expand on each other, but they add information that you would never have gotten otherwise, because they don't always synthesize all that information in all the different supplements. This is a synthesized version of all of the information. So if you just want to like not read through five different books like I do, then just pick this up and just read this. It tells you the entire history of the Minotaur species from the Grey Gem, from Talidas, all the way through Istar, all the way to current day. Um, hmm. I'm not sure they mentioned the invasion of Sylvanesty, but... As far as up to the War of the Lance, I believe they've got it all nailed down. Hmm. Yeah, that would have been an interesting one because I don't know if you... They have to do like a second part of this, right? In my opinion. If Dragonlance Nexus does a second part with Richard Knack, because Richard Knack left this short story seemingly cut in half, then I would love to get like a in-the-future version where we find out what the hell happened with the Minotaurs in Sylvanesty. Yes, they took it over. Do they keep it forever? Do they have to fight to keep it? Are they being pulled by their emperor somewhere else so they have to abandon it? Do elves ever get back together to try to retake it? Like, all of these ideas are just sort of up there. And yes, any DM can make up whatever they want, but it'd be really cool for Richard Knack to do it. You know what I mean? Just do it. <laughs> anyway, um... So we get all the geography um, of uh, the entire Minotaur Nation. Cha and that's all in chapter one, right? So you get the colony short story, then the history and lore of Minotaurs in chapter one. And then in chapter two, you actually get player options. So I don't know if they took this from Tales of Land's box set and then just sort of restructured it into two different um, 
or three different subclasses. But they have the Mariner, the Sea Marauder, and the Rageborn Sorcerer, which is like way crazy, crazy as a class subclass. I mean, you guys have got to check this stuff out. I'm not going to go into like the specifics of everything because you should just pick it up yourself and read it yourself. But just as far as my opinion goes, I've always loved Mariners. Anytime you can get a diversity of classes on a ship and then engage in an adventure, whether it's a one, three shot, um, just sort of a mini adventure on board a ship, you have a potential to explore concepts that have been wholly absent from everything else. Like, let's just imagine for a second, right? Dungeons and Dragons came out of dungeon crawling. That's really, like, when I got the box set, um, the little red box when I was a kid of just basic Dungeons and Dragons, there's like three levels represented in it. But the sample adventure was a dungeon crawl. It was just a little dungeon that you sort of crawled through. That's what Dungeons and Dragons was for a very long time. Ultimately, Dragonlance propelled it into this massive overland adventure, but there's so much opportunity for seafaring adventure, especially on Kryn, of all places. There's continents everywhere. There's islands everywhere. And there are complexities of uh, sea travel that, you know, for example, if you just have a, a warrior or a, a paladin or something that just... Uh, nice land that has to wear their armor all the time get them in the open ocean let's see how long they have that armor on you fall overboard in armor you're not swimming back i don't care how strong you are you're sinking like a rock armor's heavy so you like it completely changes the way you not only have to think about how you have your protection in place but also how do you fight if like if there's tentacles reaching out of the sea trying to pick you off the ground or off the deck and throw you off in the ocean or a beak of a creature coming up to like bite you how are you going to maneuver on a set deck space so that you not only don't bump into everyone else but you're also evading all of these potential threats even if it's just from uh, like rocks or or like uh, um uh, harpies or something they're just sort of swooping down trying to get you from the deck well, then you need to think about how you're going to avoid that and how you're going to fight effectively on this contained little space with very little cover and no concealment. I'm sorry, very little concealment and no cover. It becomes a real problem, and it just expands the possibilities of how you think about your character and how you think about your tactics in the party, how you support each other and everything. This doesn't get into like the concepts of that, but it does give you attack options if you are on a ship and how to deal with those situations. And just the fact that they they flesh that out, to me, means a lot because it's something that you could easily just sort of skate through. Like, ah, we're just gonna, it's gonna take like three days to sail from point A to point B. If you get in a fight, let's just say you're next to each other and you jump over decks and then you just fight like you do normally on land. That would be the easy way to go. That's what <laughs> Watsy did. Dragonlance Nexus took the next level, and it was dope. So I really, really appreciate that. And then chapter three is the Lost Colony Adventure. So it is, I would say, lightly inspired by the colony short story. It does not do the same story beats, which I appreciate because that could be very tiring. I will say there is a part in this adventure, which before I get to a critique, I want to just sort of let me let me fluff the adventure really quick. There are a few things better than <laughs> hitting multiple locations with wildly different feels, right? It's very easy in Dragonlance to get bogged down with that high fantasy flair. Um, what they did in a, is a very creative expression of how different cultures may inspire different locales and how that would then influence not just the setting, which yes, it must, but also um, the effects. And then there's, there's skill challenges in this, which I loved from 4th edition and seem wholly absent out of the box with 5th edition, though you can, again, as a DM, do whatever you want, add them in. But really great use of skill challenges, really great use of set pieces and locations. They flesh out this incredible town and they flesh it out more than like Shadow of the Dragon Queen ever fleshed out any of theirs, including Calaman. So very well done with taking the time to really get the lore nailed down in this adventure. 
My only complaint at the very end, there's a, there's a set piece that reminds me very much of a set piece in the comics of Dragonlance, and I'm not going to call it out, but personally, the approach that the comics took, I liked better because of the maintaining the Dragonlance vibe. Um, I like what they did with this if I just sort of ripped the Band-Aid off and said, you know what, let's just have some fun and just do whatever, because it it is like up my wheelhouse when it comes to other types of stories that I desperately love. But if I say anything about it, I'm going to be giving it away and I don't want to do that. So let's just say there's one part in it that I was like, that's great. Not 100% my version of Dragonlance, but that's okay. Not everything has to be my version. Um, very few things are, to be fair. Um, so it was, it was a great adventure, great setup, great payoff. You get to engage with some really interesting uh, NPCs and characters and, and situations. And it's just one of those things where if you like high adventure problem solving, this is going to be a dope adventure for you because it's going to do a lot of really cool stuff and, and force you to sort of think on your feet. And that's a great problem to have as a player when you're not just walking up and smacking it or lightning bolting it and moving to the next thing that you're going to smash a lightning bolt. You're actually thinking that's the best part of D and D for me anyway. All right. And so, um, then in their appendix, they have stats for all the different types of ships and they're, they're like, you know, basic category types of ships, stuff like that. It would be very cool to see a sort of, um, Again, this is very like third edition mentality, which I usually try to stay away from. But it'd be cool to have like uh, different types of sort of package add-ons that you could sort of in like price structures that you could like buy. Well, I want to have like a, a catapult on the front of my galleon. You know, what would that cost? And, and uh, you know, is there like a, a mechanic for each type of ship? Like they can have X amount of extras due to the encumbrance and size and they do sort of break it down a little bit like that, but I would really like a sort of uh, a custom build option. And again, DMs can get off their tokus and do it themselves. You don't have to rely on Dragonlance Nexus to do it, but it would be a cool follow-up if there is going to be a follow-up to the colony. So, you know, maybe uh, put that in your basket. Um, and then it also talks about new gear and new magic items, which is very, very cool. New spells are in this, which is awesome. I... I mean, <laughs> I imagine with all of the different source books for Dragon on for Dungeons and Dragons, you would never need a new type of spell. But it's cool that they thought of spells that would be relevant and gear that would be relevant for this particular adventure or source book and then created them so they didn't have to like uh, hope or, or adjust one that's kind of like it, but it's good enough. They exist in a different supplement. No, it's all right here and it's all right there for you. And then, of course, they have tons of handouts for the adventure itself. So ultimately, when I look at this, I am wildly impressed. I think um, the artwork is, uh, the interior artwork is incredible. The cover artwork is derivative. We've seen it before. It's still a great painting by a great master artist, but it is something we've seen before. So, <laughs> you know, it's not surprising. But all the interior art is amazing. The interior map of the new location they mapped out is really crazy good. All the maps for the different um, encounter areas are really, really good. Uh, the layout of this, I think, is better, but I do have, um, I have one complaint. And it's not really like a, it's not like a valid complaint. It's just an opinion complaint. When I, again, when I think of Minotaurs and stuff, I think of Greek and Roman. And while some of the designs in this you could argue would be similar to Greek or Roman in concept. A lot of them are straight up Islander, Maori, um, stuff like that, you know, Pacific Islander. And for me personally, that does not say that takes me out of it because I'm like, Oh, well that is clearly inspired by the Maori culture. That is nothing to do with Minotaurs. So whereas I love the designs because I also love Islander culture, um, it felt a little off to me, but all the imagery, the pictures, the maps and everything like that, I think are just great. The layout's great. The product is just, it's stellar. And I really think it adds something. It doesn't just, 
it doesn't exist just to give you a different flair or a different flavor or a different construct. It actually adds to the game in a very, very interesting way that is wholly absent otherwise. And that alone is worth the price of admission. So I, I really do recommend everyone sort of pick it up and, and you know, let the people over at Dragonlance Nexus know what you think about it because it's great. I mean, it's a really good product. So I would give it out of... How many dragon orbs were there? A total before they were all destroyed. Like four or five, I think there's supposed to be five. But, you know, we were engaged with three of them uh, in the Dragon's Bottom Twilight. So out of three dragon orbs, I'm going to give it three dragon orbs. It's that good. So that is my review. What do you guys have to say about this? Um, let's see. Danny H., thanks for tuning in. You're running Shadows of the Dragon Queen upon completing it. Moving on to the original War of the Lance modules you've converted. Oh, very cool. Oh, were you the one that converted them and, and hit me up? If so, please don't take this as an insult for not having reviewed yours. Um, Grim DM, great to see it getting some coverage. The DL Nexus interview with Richard Knack. Yeah, so for those of you who may not know, Dragonlance Nexus has been on the scene forever with their website. They had used to have forums and everything like that. Um, and they've been putting out material from the beginning. They also have a podcast, which I don't, if, if you don't listen to podcasts, you may not know, but it, as a Dragonlance fan, it's something you should definitely know. Um, and they just had a conversation with Richard Knack about it and um, with the Dragonlance Nexus folks themselves. Very fun, very interesting conversation and uh, a little bit of old school TSR uh, introduction to Richard Knack as well, which I always love those sort of old stories about how they got involved with the company and stuff like that. So that was very cool. So let's see, you thought uh, you bought this product and you're really enjoying looking through it. Dragonlance Nexus crushed it this year with Dragonlance products. Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, you're trying to set your love for first and second edition. Okay, I get it. I, I'm tracking you. I dig it. You may be wrong, but you think they were limited to specific length of the story by Watsi rules. Oh, really? Uh, you would have been considered a novel if the novella was... Well, that's lame if there's a story length restriction. What does that have to do with anything? All an adventure is is a story. If you're going to do a whole campaign, then... I don't know. I think that's BS. Uh, you did have a limitation on the word count. Okay. That sucks. Because <laughs> I wanted so much more. I wanted like three times that length for the short story, personally. But I I'm in, I, I love, love reading anyway, so that's just me. The ship combat mechanics is one of your favorite aspects of this product. Oh, hell yeah, it is. Goldmoon, how you doing? Great to see you. Uh, what's up, Rhiannon? Good to see you. Thanks for tuning in. All right, so looks like Age of Empires. Yeah, kind of, yeah. And and that's the, vi the visual vibe I definitely think it should have, just because of Minotaurs and Kryn and, and how they've been described thus far, but... Um, I mean, you can, you can, this is a bad example, but you know, that the tribal, uh, looking minotaur and the almost Celtic tribal image below it right here, for me, it just doesn't scream Greek or Roman culture or for that point, minute, what I would imagine minotaur culture would be, but like the artwork around the top, which is just basically sail motif repeated that does. And so again, Everyone's going to have their different interpretations for what fits and what doesn't. So just go with whatever you like and ignore what you don't like. Uh, the podcast is definitely worth a listen. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think they're all great. I mean, it's always nice to hear from other Dragonlance fans. You know, before I even started this channel, I exclusively listened to their podcast because there was nothing else out there about Dragonlance and you always had a great time. The dynamic between the Dragonlance Nexus crew is a ton of fun. Because they bust on each other like I do with my friends, you know? It's just like your, your old friends sitting around having a laugh while you're talking about a really great IP. I mean, what's wrong with that? Yeah, like that is very Maori to me, like 100%. Anyway, I'm not going to harp on it. What else? Uh, you love to play a ship-to-ship -ship combat module like this. You think there's some encounters in the original modules? Oh, yeah. Like when... The, you, we could totally make this up. So when... The heroes leave Calaman in... I'm, I'm talking about Shadow of the Dragon Queen specifically because this is a 5th edition overland or oversea adventure notes um, options. When they're leaving Calaman, you could insert a whole, you know, a, like a dragon army blockade that you had to sort of break through in order to get to the northern wastes. 
and that you could do like a whole like a crash site situation where you know the the ship is like sinking and you have to get as many people off as possible it could be like a skill challenge you do something very very cool with that and what this actually did was inspire me i'm going to go back to first edition and do a video about the vernacular of ship uh combat so it's going to talk about the specific vernacular for being on a ship and then the different types of ship that were highlighted in first edition and then um sort of how first edition dealt with you know movement over sea and stuff like that i think that will be an interesting compare and contrast versus what dl nexus did with fifth edition versus old school first edition i suspect it's not going to be dramatically different but I think it would be interesting to look at the difference, you know, at least for me. As someone who I play Dragonlance in every system, it doesn't even have to be Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, sort of examining how they used to do it versus how they do it nowadays. Um, you consider DL Nexus products as close as canon as possible. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't want to shit on anyone at WotC because I know they put a lot of effort into Shadow of the Dragon Queen and I do think it's a good adventure. But the rules for characters, like the whole first chapter of Shadow of the Dragon Queen, I mean, Dragonlance Nexus knocked it out of the park with Tasselhoff's Pouncers of Everything. I wish WotC would have just asked them to use their stuff you know, or paid them to do it and then give them, you know, a little taste on the back end of it for having done it because it's infinitely better. I mean, infinitely better. You can't even really do like an AB comparison because one is like, this is the minimum effort and the other is, well, this is what we love about Dragonlance. So <laughs> Dragonlance Nexus is always going to be doing a better job than Watsi because they actually truly genuinely care about it. They don't just, they're not just fans of it. They enjoy the novels. No, they, they care about the setting and have for decades, literally. So anyway, what else? Uh, you were, it was the other podcast again. Oh, um, I mean, I think it's just called Dragonlance Nexus podcast. I think is, is what it is. Anyway, you should, you should definitely check it out. It's totally worth it. And you can go back and listen to their reviews of old other books. And I mean, it goes way back. You know, they're talking about different editions and stuff like that. So, you know, dive in, have some fun. Anyway, all right, that is going to do it for my review. Uh, have you guys checked this out? What did you think of this? Uh, the Journals of Kaz the Minotaur, The Lost Colony by Richard Knack and the Dragonlance Nexus team. Do you enjoy ocean combat and encounters? Uh, do you like skill challenges? And have you ever run a Dragonlance Nexus adventure before? Let me know in the comments below. You can always email me at info at dlsaga.com. And I just want to take a moment and first of all, thank you all for tuning in and celebrating Dragonlance with me because it's great. <laughs> Dragonlance, that is. Um, but I would like to encourage you to subscribe to the YouTube channel if you're not already. Click the like button and leave a comment. All that goes to help other Dragonlance fans learn about this channel and this content. So, till next time, for Dragonlance Saga, my name is Adam Slangevar. <laughs>